Hi, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Museum of Science. Thanks so much for coming out on this beautiful night. Um, please take a moment now and silence your, or better yet, turn off all devices. And remember that if you need to leave before the program is over, please go up the stairs and exit out of the rear of the theater up in the back. Just minimizes interruptions. <clears throat> Depression is more common than AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. And nearly 400,000 people attempt suicide in the US every year. A Boston Globe journalist astutely wrote, like cancer, depression kills a certain amount of its victims. Like cancer, it's an illness, not a weakness. Yet I am ashamed to admit that I am a sufferer and I internalize the attitude that depression is a failure of strength or character. But contrary to the idea of depression as a weakness of character, there's a very long list of individuals who have suffered from depression and are renowned for their historic creative output. Some might surprise you. Charles Darwin and Sir Isaac Newton, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, Mark Twain, Agatha Christie, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, Edgar Degas, and Jackson Pollock, British Pine Prime Minister Winston Churchill, television stars David Letterman, Oprah Winfrey, and Ellen DeGeneres, actors Johnny Depp, Brad Pitt, and Anne Hathaway, and musicians Bob Dylan, and Beyonce. Our very special guests tonight will help us open the door on depression and suicide and bring discussion about those into the open. We are extremely fortunate to be able to include a person who is willing to share her personal experience of depression and shed light from an inside perspective. We will begin with Dr. Angur interviewing Marilyn Rice. Next, our three scientists will each present. And lastly, they will all converse together before taking questions from the audience. So please join me in the honor of welcoming to the stage first, Dr. Dost Angur and his patient, and it's not his patient, but, and Marilyn Rice. <laughs> Oops, my first shoe. You okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, for coming out and being with us today, this evening. So, um, for the benefit of the people who are here, we'll spend 15 minutes or so talking about uh, experiences you've had and uh, what things have been like for you, uh, because there is no substitute, no lecture can really convey. Uh, both the struggles, but also the dignity and uh, the resilience uh, that comes with living with some of the things that you've lived with in your life. Um, to start with, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your upbringing, your schooling, your career, what things were like for you in the early part of your life? That was a while ago. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, you just had a regular upbringing. Um, we did have an alcoholic home, um, so it was somewhat dysfunctional, um, actually greatly dysfunctional. Uh, but I managed to get through school, went to high school, went to college, um, got my bachelor's degree in education, got my master's degree in special education, and I started working. Um, so I worked um, for, for about another eight or nine years teaching, and, um, and then it hit me <laughs> like a ton of bricks. Um, I had actually been depressed probably for many, many years off and on. And, but always came out of it on my own, which I think pat, pat, does pass on you. Um, so in 1988 or so, um, things were becoming much more difficult for me to handle myself. So I went into therapy. And that was a 
surprise. <laughs> um, but over the years, I've been in therapy since that time. Um, I've had a very rough time. Um, I have had suicidality. I have had self-harm. Um, I have deep, deep depression where there was absolutely no hope. Um, I was hospitalized probably four or five times a year for many years. Um, but slowly, I started to learn more about my illness, more about what I could talk about. Um, at first, I couldn't talk about the feelings and the problems that I was having, and not being able to talk about the feelings, that you can't, just can't get them out. Um, greatly increases depression and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I've been suicidal many, many times. Luckily, I've not attempted um, it, but right, there's always a plan. So I want to ask you more about yeah. suicide in a second. But when you talk about uh, it hitting you like a ton of bricks, you were in your early 30s? I was in my early 30s, yeah. I was probably, um, let me see, in 88, yeah. Was, yeah. By the time I got treatment, I was about 35 years old, which is late. You know. And why did you say it was a surprise that you went into therapy? Well, because I just thought I'd go in and you know, just chat and say, you know, my father drives me crazy, you know, it's so hard to live with an alcoholic and that, that, that. It like burst open the dam. It mm -hmm. really did. Um, I had so much inside of me. Um, very painful, painful stuff. Um, just hurt like hell all the time, you know, with the depression. Um, and having to fight that, fight to get to work or fight just to, um, just to exist each day, you know, and not, and not leave the world, you know. Um, so it, 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 there's, there's like a constant battle. Um, so you eventually stopped being able to work? I stopped, couldn't stop, yeah, I stopped working in um, 1990, I think it was. Um, and at that point, I actually spent seven months in a state hospital, very suicidal, very um, self-harm inclined kind of thing. Um, and I was, when I'm in rage, which is probably part mania um, at that time. I was just a different person then. I mean, you couldn't control me. I had such anger. It was like mm -hmm. at everybody and anything, and especially at myself. So mania and depression can sometimes go together in people who have bipolar disorder. Definitely. And definitely. depression is part of that, depression. and mania can be too. Yeah. In your dark periods when you would feel down in those years, what was that like for you? What would you experience? You'd experience, like you, you would look out a window and you would see nothing nothing there for you, like nobody to support you, nothing to enjoy, um, just no existence. And you, and you really were very numb and couldn't feel anything. Um, I remember looking out the window for the inpatient units, thinking that. Um, and th that's why I would end up in the hospital, too, so I could stay safe. Um, but um, it's, it's such an empty, feeling and such a, you feel so, um, it's hard to describe, like more than emptiness, you feel invisible. You feel, it's like nothing is going to fix this except to die. Nothing will. For someone who uh, had a master's degree, had worked for many years, had a family, had friends, that's a very lonely place to be. It's very lonely, yeah. It's very isolated, very, yeah, you just all by yourself with, with um, without anybody, and you can't reach out to people at that point, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. You just kind of keep pulling and pulling into yourself. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned self-harm and suicide, mm -hmm. and they're of course not necessarily the same thing. Right. Some people actually cut or burn themselves, and they're hurting themselves, but they're not doing it with an intent to die. Correct. Is that yeah. what happened to That's you with the self-harm? That's what happened to me, yeah, with the self-harm. I used to cut, um, I think in the early years, before I understood it, um, that part of it was because I couldn't talk about it. You know, I couldn't tell, tell anybody, so I would end up showing them. You know, I'd call my therapist after I hurt myself and say, and they're like, you know, we know you have a lot of pain, you're in a lot of pain, but call us first. Mm -hmm. Eventually I learned to do that, um, and I haven't cut in many years, um, and I don't need it. I used to think I needed it, and um, it's not something, it is a choice mm -hmm. to do so, but you, at that, point in time, it's like, it overtakes you, you have to do it. It's like, I have to have that cigarette, you can't just, um, you know, just, I can't wait any longer, kind of thing. It's almost a compulsion. It is, a, yeah, mm -hmm. it definitely is. 
So you said that you probably had felt depressed on and off for years before the diagnosis right. and before the treatments began. Um, do you remember when suicide first occurred to you as an option? I think it was in high school. Um, you know, at that time, my father had become a, a really bad alcoholic, um, and I had a lot of responsibility for my family and taking take care of my mother and being her companion, actually, um, for many, many years. Um, and I can remember um, just just not feeling good, you know, always feeling sad or invisible. I had, problem with invisibility, um, like nobody paid attention or I didn't think anybody knew who I was and stuff. I got a whole, whole semester of one class, she never re reported me. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I don't belong here. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're there or not, yeah. or if you're on this world, on this earth or not. Right, yeah. exactly. It's just why, why bother to be here? Yeah. You know? So 15 years before you first got diagnosed and treated, you'd already ha started having thoughts about suicide. I had suicidal thoughts, yeah. And when things got bad and you had repeated hospitalizations, did you contemplate suicide? Definitely. Um, I had different plans. Um, I, I have had um, I have dates. You know, I'm going to wait till this happens. And when this is done with, um, then, you know, then I'll kill myself. A big one was, was I had for years was when my mother died that I would kill myself the day after she died. Um, and she died in uh, 2006, and I'm still here. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it passed kind of thing. It was, it was still there in my head all those years, though. Mm -hmm. And now I just wouldn't do it to certain people, mm -hmm. you know. So in those darkest moments when you really thought maybe being dead was a good option, what kinds of plans would you make? How did you think you might die? How, um, well, you said, as a cutter, I thought of more cutting, um, and which veins to cut and how to cut. Um, pills, um, I, I have medical issues, so I have a, a lot of, lots of kinds of pills. Um, that, and that's actually the plan these days, if I were to enact it, which I hope I never do. Um, and um, running away, drowning, it, you know, just, anything to take away the pain. I used to, when I was in the hospital, I used to pray to God to, to let me die right then. I mean, I was so desperate to, not, to, um, not to live, to get out of that pain, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, you already mentioned a little bit that you're in a different phase of your life now. Oh, definitely. And you've um, struggled with these issues, you've conquered some of them, mm -hmm. or you've learned to manage some of the others. Right. Uh, what are things like for you now? Things are pretty good right now. There, um, I actually work uh, full time um, as a peer specialist. Uh, I work right now working with an elder population. Um, you know, give, trying to give them hope and instill the recovery values of hope and being satisfied with your life. Um, I think that's what's the biggest thing that I've come to in the past just three or four years, and it's not even that long. Um, was that, you know, I can be satisfied with my life, you know, happy to do things, um, be comfortable with people, talk about my illness. I have no problems, as you can tell, talking about <laughs> my illness. Um, and I think a big thing that, that, I, that really turned the corner for me is when I accepted my illness as just another part of me. You know, I have arthritis, you know, I have a heart thing, I just, and I have bipolar disorder. It's just like the list of things. And these are the meds that I take for all these things. Once I accepted that and said, you know, it's just a piece of me. It doesn't run my life, you know, and I can control it. Mm -hmm. I, um, I learned my symptoms. I learned my illness, what it does to me. When I'm feeling things, I reach out right away. I don't wait. I don't postpone it. I always postponed it before. Over the years, like, you know, wait till I'm really bad. You know, cut up or whatever. So I want to ask you about the peer specialist job for mm -hmm. a second. So a peer specialist is somebody with a lived experience themselves right. of a psychiatric problem who is now working in a mental health setting, Correct. helping others with similar problems. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is, yeah. What's that like for you? It's great. Um, I, I, I go see my old ladies. <laughs> you know, it's great. I work as an elder peer specialist, which, and I can share experiences. We remember things together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they look to me to say, well, you got through this. How can I get through it? Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't counsel. You know, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. Mm -hmm. But I say, you know, well, this worked for me. Maybe you can try it. 
You know, I'm really anxious today. Well, let's do some deep breathing, um, you know, and see if that helps. Um, and, you know, and as working with the elders, especially, is that they're not young, we're not young anymore. We have different goals, and we look towards the end of life things um, versus, you know, the younger person who's just starting out with their illness and they want to work and they want to do this and do that. Um, you know, we're going the other way and, and have to take care of things. And, and it's great. It, it, I really get along with the people I work with, and they're just it's like, I'm so glad that you're here and that you really, you feel it too. I'm really not alone, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it seems like this is different from uh, some of the messages that you were given throughout the course of your life uh, by treaters, mm -hmm. by hospitals, and so on, that things m won't get better, and you better right. lower your own expectations, and so on. We talked earlier, before we started, mm -hmm. about how some of those things maybe held you back over the years. And it seems like this is a different message that you're I, giving right. the folks you work with now. Well, I think it's changed. You know, when I first started treatment, um, it was like, you know, be in the hospital and manage the symptoms, drug you out, or, you know, stay, I mean, I had month-long stays in the hospital, two months. You're lucky if you get three days now. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, <laughs> for different reasons. For different reasons. For you know, insurance, insurance companies. Um, you know, uh, and it was just, it was treating the symptoms, you know, the depression. I've gone through many drugs, um, you know, antidepressants and stuff. I've used that ECT as a treatment, um, which worked, by the way. That's electroconvulsive That's therapy, therapy, sometimes right. known as shock therapy. Um, which a lot of people are afraid of, and they're horrified by it, but it's, it's not so bad, you know. It's a very effective treatment. It's effective, yeah. It brought me out of a deep, deep depression. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple of minutes left, but I want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, there may be people in the audience, and there are certainly people out there in the world who um, may contemplate that suicide's an option for themselves. Mm -hmm. Or we all know somebody who's thought about suicide, just statistically. Right. Whether we know it or not, this is out there. What do you say to people who think that maybe suicide's an option for them? Uh, if you're thinking suicide is an option, then you need to wait. One of the things is wait. When you're feeling that way, I have a, I had a thing in my medicine cabinet that I was feeling suicidal. These are the steps that I would take before I did anything. Because it, the, the intensity passes. You, know, you still feel lousy, you feel just like crap. You still may want to die, but that intensity of like grabbing something or driving into a tree or will pass. So that's one of the things. Um, and that things do change. Um, you know, one day they're horrible. You have the worst day, and you can't think of anything that you want to live for. And the next day, there's that glimmer of hope. Oh, yeah, now my Aunt Sue is coming to visit next week. <laughs> you know, um, the hope is you, you get little things, and that's how I use my hope. And I, it, it, my hope comes very weirdly, actually. <laughs> when I'm in the hospital, when I'm in the hospital and nothing is working and nothing is working, I wait about two and a half to three weeks. And I can tell when I'm supposed to be in the hospital when I'm supposed to leave, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have what I call this little niggle inside of me. This, this guy like starts gnawing at me, saying, maybe, maybe I can do this. Or maybe it won't be so bad if I do this. And, and you start to work at it. You start to look further into it. Um, and you work hard. It's not like it's going to be easy. Oh, yeah, I'm really depressed t just today. But yesterday I was really depressed. But today I'm no better, usually. But, you know, it doesn't go away in 24 hours, the feelings. Yes. You know, it does stick around. You have to tolerate the feelings. You need to um, work at counteracting some of those, the thoughts. That, you know, self-esteem is the big problem there, too. I mean, I have a laundry list. You can see how awful I am, you know? Mm. <laughs> But you've been through it enough times that you know this is right. part of that cycle, and you can look at it a little bit with perspective. But for people who haven't been through it enough, it might feel like this is all there is. Right, and there's it's no all other there way. Is. And it helps to hear that uh, from someone who's been there that this isn't all there is. Right. What about the converse? Uh, there are probably also people in the audience who think this would never happen to them. This is for mm. somebody else, somebody with a different problem. I'm not one of those people. What do you mm. say to them? I say be nice, but <laughs> no, it, it can happen to anybody. I mean, I was 35 years old, you know, at the time, and the whole, my whole life was pulled out from under me, you know, and I, I totally took a different turn. Um, it can happen in any way. My brother, for example, has a, um, I don't know, some kind of heart that doesn't work right, and he has a, had to have a defibrillator put in to his chest. 
because this heart can stop any time. That changed his whole life it, because it pulled out everything that he knew, everything that he did and stuff. And so he's experiencing the same types of things. Anything can happen to, to get you off track, but it does get better. Marilyn, you're great. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for having this conversation with us. Thank you for coming. Thanks. All right, let's get going. So um, just a brief uh, description, um, since we're going to be talking about psychiatric disorders all evening. Uh, very generally speaking, we can say that psychiatric disorders are alterations in mood, perception, thinking, and or behavior to an extent that causes suffering and problems in living. As I said, psychiatric disorders are universal. They've been with us since the dawn of history. There are written accounts from uh, the earliest written texts of human experience suggesting um, uh, abnormal experiences uh, have always been part of us. Um, and most major psychiatric disorders appear in all countries and ethnic groups. In fact, some have speculated that psychiatric problems are some of the price that we've paid for the evolution of this thing that we call the human mind. When you have such a complex system, it's bound to uh, uh, deviate from the norm in certain ways. And as a corollary to that, these are extremely common disorders. So the World Health Organization um, estimates that uh, in the world, each year, 350 million people suffer from depression. Over uh, 50 million people suffer from schizophrenia. Um, over 70 million people have alcohol use problems. 48 million people live with dementia. And this number is rising fast with the aging of human societies. Um, so these are huge numbers, especially this one. Um, is, of course, larger than the population of the entire United States. So there's a whole uh, America out there in the world um, living with depression. And, of course, each of these problems are serious uh, challenges in their own way. Um, but the more common ones tend to make a bigger public health impact. Uh, for the United States, this is uh, uh, a slide from the federal government from a national survey on drug use and health, the mental health findings. In 2013, well over 40 million adults aged 18 or longer, had any mental illness in the past year. That's 18.5% of all adults. So looking at you in the audience, you know, a couple of hundred people maybe, maybe a little over 100, uh, there are uh, a couple of dozen people among us who have struggled with mental illness in the last year. Um, aged 18 or older, about 10 million, that's over 4%, have serious mental illnesses. Serious mental illness is a term that refers to uh, more chronic and more impairing conditions um, that uh, also have, of course, their own significant public health impact. These include things like schizophrenia, but also sometimes bipolar disorder and many other conditions. Um, and then the percentage of adults with any mental illness in the past year is highest for adults aged 26 to 49, followed by 18 to 25, and then 50 or older. So these illnesses impair people uh, at a time in their lives when they're supposed to be most productive, when they're making the greatest contributions to society, when they're uh, having careers, uh, having families, and so on. So uh, they take a particularly high toll, high, high make a particularly high impact because of that. Women are a little more likely than men uh, to have any mental illness and serious mental illness. Um, there's also, of course, a huge substance use disorder problem uh, among the people with mental illness, but also uh, among people without mental illness. Um, and then suicide. An estimated uh, about 4% of the US population aged 18 or older has had serious thoughts about suicide in the past year. Um, this percentage has remained stable in nationwide surveys, so this is not, some, this is not a fluke, this is not a, a statistical aberration. Um, and then among adults uh, 18 or older, about 1% have actually made suicide plans in the past year, and uh, a little less than 1% have actually attempted suicide. These are massive numbers. And again, if you think about just any gathering of people uh, such as this one, there are people among us who have thought about suicide and who have made plans to kill themselves. This is about disability, uh, a measure that uh, is used by the World Health Organization called Years Lived with Disability. When you look in the United States at Years Lived with Disability, what you see is that the biggest offender is what they called mental and behavioral disorders. This is actually larger than um, any other condition, including things like uh, musculoskeletal disorders, back pain, and so on. When you add neurological disorders, brain diseases together actually are far and away the biggest offender. So these disorders are, can be fatal, they cause enormous suffering, but they also cause an enormous burden for people living with disability year after year. Um, again, these, the, you know, 
put together, the, the impact that these disorders make on public health is really huge. And they're costly. I already uh, mentioned this. Um, you can see the different amounts. Uh, and these are not uh, just direct care costs that uh, we spend in hospitals, emergency rooms, and doctor's offices, and so on. But they also include the public health impact, um, the health insurance payments, the public assistance programs, um, um, housing programs, and so on. And of course, you can see things like schizophrenia are right up there with many other common disorders. Uh, so is depression, so is al Alzheimer's disease. Each of these is in the same range as heart disease or cancer. Um, when the WHO looks around the world um, at uh, public health uh, spending that's devoted to mental health, you see that uh, globally mental health spending is less than $2 per person per year and less than 25 cents in low-income countries. So I just got through telling you that, that these disorders are costly, and yet what we're actually spending on them is a pittance. It's nowhere near uh, what it would take to actually address these problems. Uh, so um, imagine how much more costly they would be if we actually did the right thing and um, spent money on helping people with these conditions and uh, spent money on research to eradicate the conditions. Um, and of course, almost half the world's population lives in a country where there is one psychiatrist or less to serve 200,000 people. So these are horribly underserved uh, problems. Uh, this is a slide with a lot of information on it. Uh, it's put out by an organization called Mental Health America. I'm just going to draw your attention to the state ranking. And the number one state is Massachusetts, and number two is Vermont, number three is Maine. This is a ranking based on uh, lowest prevalence of mental illness and highest rates of access. So we in Massachusetts are actually number one in the country in terms of what we can do for people with mental illnesses, with psychiatric conditions. And yet, we have people dying on the streets every day we have people committing suicide every day here in Massachusetts. Uh, we have people going into hospital for um, exacerbation of their psychiatric problems every day in Massachusetts. So uh, this is not really a message for complacency. Uh, this is a message for if this is the best that we are doing around the United States, I shudder to think what it's like in all the other states. And psychiatric disorders are fatal. The WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates that about one million people die from suicide each year around the world. This is a global mortality rate of about 16 per 100,000. Um, in the United States, uh, and actually around the world, this comes out to about one death every 40 seconds. And uh, in the United States, the uh, mortality rate from suicide is a little higher than the global average. Not by much, but it is a little higher. And um, this tells you uh, how frequent death by suicide, in fact, is. Again, underscoring the public health impact of these conditions. So what does the anatomy of suicide look like? A completed suicide, somebody who kills themselves, um, this phenomenon takes place at the confluence of three factors. There is almost always underlying psychopathology, um, referring to diagnosable psychiatric illnesses, things like depression, bipolar disorder, substance use disorder, schizophrenia, and other things. Um, that's a chronic factor that's almost always associated with completed suicides. Um, but then you actually need acute psychic pain. There comes a moment for many people where um, it just feels like the person can no longer go on. Uh, the pain is too much. And um, then, as we were discussing with Marilyn, too, it seems like uh, suicide is the only option. It seems logical in that moment that uh, nobody can bear this much pain, and the only thing left to do is, is suicide. And then the thing, third thing that you need is access to means. It's actually really critical to think about this for a second. As Marilyn said, too, um, that acute psychic pain passes. That's not permanent. But if you're sitting at a table and there's a loaded gun on the table, um, you're much more likely to complete a suicide than if you're sitting at a table and there's no gun in the house. Of course, the same thing goes for uh, many other means of access. So um, the confluence of both access and this acute psychic pain are what build on the underlying psychopathology to lead to completed suicides. I emphasize the term completed suicide, somebody who actually kills themselves, because actually the data suggests that for every completed suicide, there are many, many attempts that are made. So um, the rule is to survive a suicide attempt. It's not to die by a suicide attempt. But of course, uh, many factors go into determining who will die from a suicide attempt. And these are things like uh, the fatality of the attempt. Shooting, hanging, uh, violent means are always more fatal than overdose or some of the other uh, things that people try. Who's at risk? 
So I already mentioned underlying psychiatric condition is almost always associated with suicide, uh, particularly depression and bipolar disorder. People with these conditions are at higher risk compared to some of the other psychiatric conditions. Interestingly, medical conditions, things like chronic illnesses, pain disorders, terminal illnesses, uh, are also associated with completed suicides. And then finally, a family history of suicide. Um, if it's part of the family lore that somebody dying by suicide is thinkable, it's happened, that boundary has already been crossed, um, it, it actually puts others at risk in that family. What are some of the other factors? Older age, people who are older make more uh, lethal attempts, and that's why they tend to die more frequently from a suicide attempt compared to younger people. Male sex, white race, firearms in the household, um, these are all different factors. So what do we do about this in psychiatry? How do we assess the problem? While the assessment of suicide is a must, really, for every psychiatric assessment, in fact, you fail your uh, board certification exam in psychiatry if you don't uh, evaluate the patient you're interviewing for suicidality. So uh, this is built into our profession. Um, unfortunately, there is no single profile or characteristic presentation of individuals who attempt suicide. So uh, every case is different, every person is different. Uh, the clinician needs to be on their toes and be able to take all of the information into account to understand if somebody's at risk. And the assessment requires evaluation of psychiatric and medical history, current mental state, and other risk factors. So what you're doing is using the knowledge of risk factors to see if the person you're sitting with is at a higher than average risk for suicide but then also uh, understanding the current mental state because of, of the psychic pain factor that I talked about. The most important component is understanding the current mental content. Um, many patients may not volunteer suicidal thinking, but they will talk about it when, when asked. Um, so we ask. In fact, there is often relief when somebody speaks about the unspeakable. Many people who have lived with the idea for uh, days or weeks but have not even uh, uh, admitted it to themselves that that's what's going on, uh, find themselves talking to a psychiatrist about what's really going on in their minds. So it's really important to talk about suicide when you're assessing it for it. These questions can range from, do you ever have thoughts about death and dying, to have you considered killing yourself, to do you intend to kill yourself, do you intend to commit suicide, have you made preparations of what kind. In fact, scientists become quite skilled at asking for uh, and asking about gory detail of suicide plans. Um, because we need to understand what exactly is going on in the person's mind and uh, what kind of risk is that putting the person at. This assessment needs to be done in a non-judgmental, supportive, empathic uh, manner. Patients are often confused and ambivalent about their thoughts and plans, so the assessment itself may provide significant relief. Um, somebody who actually starts to describe what's going on inside of them actually can now uh, start to order their own feelings and thoughts and gain some measure of control over them. Um, one thing that uh, in the lay public is often thought about is whether asking about suicide will suggest suicide to people, and it just doesn't work that way. You can't plant suicidal ideas in somebody's mind just by asking them. Um, this is not a shameful topping, topic. This is an incredibly important topic, and um, it, it, the only disservice you will do is if you don't talk about it. And as we talked about with Marilyn, um, there's lots of factors for resilience. So psychiatrists often ask about reasons to live for. What keeps you alive? Of course, it's not going to surprise you to hear that most often um, these reasons are people, people in the individual's life, um, the, the uh, aftermath, what would it be like for the survivors? These are major considerations for uh, individuals who are seriously considering suicide. Um, another interesting one is beliefs about what happens after you die. Of course, these beliefs vary greatly and widely, um, and uh, you have to understand what the per person thinks will happen to them after they're dead, because that can have a major impact on, on uh, suicidal ideation as well. And future plans. It's uh, also um, common practice in uh, psychiatric parlance to talk about uh, the patient being future-oriented, asking the person, what are you going to do for your birthday? Are you planning to take any trips? What are your future goals? Obviously, somebody who's seriously considering suicide hasn't thought that far. Treatment. The first consideration is safety. Clinical judgment is paramount. When uh, we're sitting with someone who we fear may be suicidal, um, you can collect all the factors, but you have to look at the totality of the picture. 
you have to understand um, what life is like for that individual and whether the clinician thinks that there is uh, a serious risk of suicide. Uh, there is no substitute for that, no amount of uh, reassurance from you know family members or the patient themselves that no, 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 it's true that this is what's going on, but I'm going to be fine, uh, can really um, um, uh, replace that judgment. And of course, the thing to do is to remove potential means for self-harm and frequent supervision because uh, of this fact that that psychic pain actually passes, uh, that acute suicidal ideation and people who have an intent to kill themselves don't stay in that mental state for very long. So the task is really to keep them safe. Uh, of course, underlying and treating, uh, identifying and treating underlying psychiatric disorders um, is necessary, and then identifying risk factors and addressing the modifiable ones. Um, so you worry more about uh, an aging man who's recently been diagnosed with a major medical condition and is also depressed and has thought about suicide uh, because that's exactly the profile of a completed suicide. Because of the importance of uh, identification, detection, and safety in the acute suicidal period, um, many different groups are actually developing um, public health campaigns to raise awareness about suicide and to get people to talk about what's going on. Of course, um, the warning signs, as you read through them, some of them are going to seem obvious and others may seem non-specific and maybe even trivial. Um, but again, if, if you get the word out uh, to the population that um, cer certain people are at significant risk and we have to um, keep those people safe, uh, that could actually make a major public health impact. And again, really the key word here is to talk. Um, talking is what gets the facts out in the open and talking is what helps. Um, the truth is psychiatric disorders are highly treatable as f among many other medical conditions. Um, our ability to treat depression, to treat bipolar disorder, exceeds our ability to treat diabetes or hypertension. Um, and suicidal ideation is a temporary state, and yet we're not very good at predicting and preventing suicide. Um, it, there are too many people dying from this essentially preventable condition. Um, we often know what to do, but we're not able to uh, intervene in sufficiently effective ways, and we're not able to um, uh, carry out early detection in a way that would actually be, have a meaningful public health impact. So there's clearly a need for better means of detection and intervention. That's where our field is at today. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Professor Matthew Nock. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh, mine worked faster. <laughs> so thank you to the Museum of Science for having this session on this really important topic, and thank you all for coming. Uh, with the time that I have, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I think is one of um, the most important uh, issues in understanding and predicting and preventing suicidal behavior, and one that I think picks up nicely on um, Dose, the end of Dose's uh, wonderful presentation. And what I want to talk about is how do we measure the suicidal mind? And this is one of the most uh, difficult things that we face, not just as uh, researchers and clinicians, but as a society. Stated more plainly, we really want to know who's thinking about suicide. We want to get better at detection and prediction. And I would agree 100%, the best thing to do, and if there's one thing you take from, from tonight's uh, discussion is, if you think someone might be at risk, you should ask um, if they're thinking about suicide. And if someone tells you they are, you should take that very seriously and act as swiftly um, and carefully as possible. Unfortunately, in many instances, uh, People don't come to us and tell us they're thinking about suicide, or they don't tell us that they're thinking about suicide. So how can we get better at detecting uh, those thoughts when a person doesn't tell us about them? And I want to talk about just a few quick examples to, um, to illustrate the point. And then I'll talk about what we think are some uh, advances in our ability to do just this. So the first one I want us to consider briefly is the case of uh, Gia Alamond. For those who don't know, Ms. Alamond was a, a well-known actress, model, and TV star uh, who appeared on television shows such as The Bachelor and related shows. Um, she was somebody who uh, was known to be very char charismatic, uh, had lots of friends, um, very well known and very, very much a public figure. 
And she lived in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that there were many eyes on her. She was very active in social media, um, posting regularly on platforms like um, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And I just pulled a few somewhat random postings from um, the summer of 2013. We see here she was attending what appears to be a Broadway show, Cinderella, with her mother and grandmother. About a week later, um, she was in Las Vegas with her uh, boyfriend, at the time NBA star um, Ryan Anderson on the right and another friend on the left. And about a week later, she, I believe she's at an award show and she says, I love my hair so much, y'all have me taking bathroom selfies, hashtag yes, yes, yes. So someone who is, um, appeared to be very happy, very well connected with family, with friends, um, and, and doing well overall. Unfortunately, um, sadly, exactly one week after this last post, um, she hung herself in her home and died by suicide the next day. So a case where uh, it wasn't very clear, there, there, were, there weren't uh, uh, signs that were readily available to the naked eye. Another case that's much more recent um, and much more familiar to us this week is the tragedy that recently happened with the German Wings Flight 9525, which if you've followed any media in the past week, you've known, unfortunately, this, this flight took off last Tuesday morning, as most flights do, without um, much aberration. And when the flight hit its cruising altitude, the co-pilot took over, Andres Lubitz, and unfortunately, shortly thereafter, he directed this plane down into the French Alps, taking his own life, as well as that of 149 people who are on board with him. In both of these cases, there were some earlier indications that the people involved had thought about suicide. There's some suggestion that they had engaged in suicidal behavior, but there wasn't any, anything that was observed close to the death that, this, that, that led people to believe this person was at elevated risk, at least none that was um, acted upon. So that brings me to sort of the framing of this, this brief dis discussion here is, how is it that we are assessing suicidal thoughts? And Dr. Unger um, talked quite a bit about how we do that currently. Right now, the state of the art is we assess for risk factors that lead us to believe a person might be at elevated risk, and then we ask people. I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, if I think that someone might be at risk for suicidal behavior, I'll ask them, and I'll ask them some of the questions that were um, nicely posted up earlier. Unfortunately, many people will, who are thinking about suicide will deny that they're having such thoughts for a number of reasons. One is many people are motivated to deny or conceal these thoughts for fear of being stopped, for fear of being intervened upon, for fear of losing their job, for fear of how people will respond, and so they intentionally withhold those thoughts from others. Not everyone who doesn't talk about their suicidal thoughts is, is intentionally withholding or, or, or being dishonest. Many people lack conscious awareness of their current level of risk, and many people lack the ability to talk about um, and to describe what it is they're experiencing or that they're having thoughts of suicide, and we think this is especially true in children and adolescents. Whatever the case that a person's not reporting their suicidal thoughts, we know this is happening. We know this because one of the highest risk periods for suicide death, unfortunately, is the week after patients are discharged from a psychiatric hospital. So presumably clinicians aren't releasing patients knowing that they're at risk. Um, if someone says they're going to kill themselves, we'll bring them into the hospital for treatment and not let them leave until we're convinced that they're at at least a, lo a low enough risk that they're safe to leave the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, a number of patients aren't. We see a huge spike in mortality in that week. It could be that patients are um, uh, misguiding clinicians. It could be people are not being honest with themselves, but we know there is this risk that's carried after people are discharged. We also know that unfortunately most patients, about 80% who die by suicide while they're in the hospital, explicitly denied having suicidal thoughts or intentions in their last assessment before dying. All this to suggest that we need methods of assessing suicide risk that don't just rely on a person's self-report. Stated more plainly, if we have a person in front of us, a patient, a friend, a loved one, a colleague, and they're telling us, I don't want to kill myself, what we really want to know is, in addition to that, what are their unspoken thoughts? Are there implicit cognitions? What are they thinking uh, that they may not be revealing to us? What are their unspoken thoughts, or as we say, their implicit cognitions? those that aren't reliant on conscious introspection or explicit self-reporting. And this is something that we've always wanted to know, right? We've, since the beginning of time, we've wanted to know what's in the minds of other people that they're not telling us. I'm wondering right now, what are you thinking that you're not telling me? Are you, is any of this making sense? You think about uh, what are your, your, your family members, your colleagues, your patients, your doctors, what might they be thinking that, that they're not revealing to me? 
So we've always had this question of how do we know what other people are thinking about, and we've never been able to, to measure those implicit cognitions in any kind of uh, accurate way until recently. In the past few decades, psychological scientists have developed ways of measuring implicit cognition in ways that don't rely on a person's self-report, but that uses their behavior to make inferences or, or gain measurements about what a person might be thinking. We do this using uh, behavior in the form of tests of memory and reaction time and the like. One example of this is the Implicit Association Test, or IAT, developed by Tony Greenwald and colleagues nearly 20 years ago. I would ask by show of hands who's heard of the IAT, but I can't see a single one of you. So I'll, so I'll just assume no one's heard of the IAT, and I'll tell you about it. So this is a, a, a brief, often computer-based reaction time test. It takes about five minutes, and it m asks you to classify stimuli, words or images, onto, trying to reverse this, the left of, left of the screen or the right of the screen, and it uses the speed with which you make these classifications to make inferences about the associations you hold between different concepts and attributes. I'll help make sense of that. This is used early on by social psychologists to measure things like how you think about white people versus black people, old people versus young people, uh, men versus women, Republicans versus Democrats. And so a common IAT um, that you may have heard of or may have seen, it's one of the early versions, um, would focus on how you think about Republicans versus Democrats. Many people say they're independent, but we think maybe they're leaning one way or the other, so we can try and get a measure of this. And, and an, a political IAT would look something like this. Pretend you're seated at a computer screen. You've got a finger on a left key and a finger on a right key. Let's say the E key and the I key, if you can visualize that. Now, I'm gonna show you images on the screen. I'll show you images of Bill Clinton or George Bush, and these will be interspersed. And I'll also show you good words, smart, courage, leader, and bad words, stupid, a uh, liar, weak. And I'm gonna intersperse these, I'll show them randomly. And what I want you to do is hit the left key whenever you see Bill Clinton or a good word, hit the right key whenever you see George Bush or a bad word. And I want you to do this as fast as you can for let's say 40 trials without making any mistakes and I'll measure your response time in milliseconds. Now we flip it. Now hit the left key for George Bush and good and the right key for Bill Clinton and bad. And we measure your response time in milliseconds as you make these classifications. Interestingly, if you're a Democrat, you're significantly faster responding when Bill Clinton and Good are paired on the same key. When you've got to put George Bush and Good on the same key, it takes just a little bit longer to push that button because you don't associate those things as being like each other. And it's a nonpartisan test. The opposite is true as well. Republicans are faster responding when Bush and Good are paired, slower responding when Clinton and Good are paired. And this test can actually make pretty accurate predictions about how independent, people say, I'm independent. You give them this test, and people who have a uh, faster for Clinton and Good tend to make decisions, tend to settle on policies or, or, or vote for policies that are more liberal and the opposite is true for policies that are more conservative. So a quick, simple test of association, some nice features of this test, it's been shown to be pretty reliable over time and pretty resistant to attempts to fake good, so to speak. You can speed up and slow down if you know what the test is doing, but it's very difficult to, 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 to do. It's been shown to be sensitive to change over the course of treatment. Bethany Teachman at the University of Virginia has done some really nice work showing you measure implicit associations people have about spiders, you treat their spider phobias. People's implicit associations about spiders change after they're treated, which is really nice. So it's, it's responsive to treatment. And it's been shown to be predictive of future behavior, largely in social psychology studies. What we wondered is, can we use this as a measure of how people are thinking about death or suicide? And so we created a, a suicide implicit association test, and I wanna give you a sense of what this looks like. So instead of, we use the same, structure, but instead of Clinton and Bush, we use the concepts of death and life. And instead of good or bad, we use the attributes of is it like me or not like me. And so on this task, you'd see this on your computer screen and you'll see words appear in the middle of the screen. And what I want you to do is if you see a death related word, uh, suicide, dead, dying, push the left key. If you see a life related, wor related word, uh, life, living, thriving, surviving, push the right key. If you see a me related word, I, me, mine, push left. If you see not me, push right. They, them, theirs. So what I want you to do is, and we're not recording anyone's reaction time here, but I want to give you a feel for this test. When I put stimuli up, you just tell me if it goes on the left or the right. Ready? Just shout out loud. Yeah. Left. Okay, so you do, good, you all pass. You do this for 40 trials, and now we'll flip it. Now we'll pair life with me. So before we had death and me paired, we'll measure your response times when death is paired with me. Now we, same task, we'll flip it. Now we'll pair life with me. 
what we hypothesize, what we'd expect is that people who are, are suicidal uh, will be faster responding when death and me are paired on the same key. People who are not should be faster responding when life and me are paired on the same key because you associate those things as being like each other. So same task. Left. Left. All right. All right. Left. Left. Right. So you get the idea. Um, so you make simple test of association. We, we want to see, does this test distinguish between people who are suicidal and versus not? And in a series of studies now, uh, what we found is that this test can distinguish between suicide attempters and non-attempters, people who have recently made a suicide attempt and those who haven't. And so what we have did in an initial study is go to the, down the street to the emergency room at Mass General Hospital with laptops, and as people are coming into the psychiatric emergency room, administer this task, and we see significant differences between people who just came in having made a suicide attempt and people who came in under psychiatric distress without having made a suicide attempt. Importantly, we also see that this test can improve the prediction of who's going to make a suicide attempt in the future. These are data from MGH. On the left, identification with life, these are people who responded more quickly when life and me are paired. And this is, I should note, an at-risk sample. So there are people coming through the ER who had recently made a, who had made a previous suicide attempt. Of those who respond more quickly when life and me are paired, 10% made an attempt in the next six months. Of those who respond more quickly when death and me are paired, 33, nearly 33% made a suicide attempt in the next six months. So significantly higher risk among those who identify death with me. Most importantly, I think, we see that performance on this test significantly improves the prediction of who's going to make a suicide attempt in the future, above and beyond clinician prediction, which in this study was no better than a coin toss, better than patient prediction. We asked patients themselves, are you going to make a suicide attempt in the next six months? What's the likelihood of that? Patients are better than chance at predicting that. Uh, we put in a number of other predictors like uh, disorder, severity of ideation at the time we tested them. With all of those things in, this test still improved the prediction of who's going to make a suicide attempt over the next six months, suggesting uh, maybe we are able to do something initially to, to try and measure um, the suicidal mind. We see similar effects in the general population. So uh, we created a website, and if anyone's interested in learning more about implicit cognition, not about just about suicide, but about anxiety, uh, depression, mental disorders more generally, I would encourage you to check out this website, implicitmentalhealth.com, where we have information about implicit cognition, and actually IATs up there on these different topics, so you can go and take some of these IATs, and if you want, get feedback. If you don't want, you, you, you won't get feedback. We put the, the suicide IAT up, and so far I've collected data on over 6,000 people, and we see a, a similar pattern. Scores are lower, so these are below zero means they're in the direction of responding faster when life and me are paired, but people who have made a suicide attempt uh, are slower at, at pairing life with me, so a weaker association between life and the self. And we see that that tracks over time with people who have never made an attempt on the left, people who have made an attempt more than a year ago in the middle, people who have recently made an attempt on the right, so these scores seem like they, they, they move over time which means that these scores might be helpful for tracking suicidal risk. So this is just one measure of uh, uh, implicit suicidal cognition. There are others. I want to share information just about one other. What we think, in addition to identifying uh, with death, people who are thinking about suicide, people with suicide on their mind, might have an intentional bias towards suicide-related information. So if I'm somebody who's thinking about suicide, and I'm you know, walking around the world, and I see the word suicide, that's very salient to me. That should capture my attention, which would then interfere with my ability to do anything else for a few milliseconds. And so we tested this out using a variation of a classic psychological test called the Stroop test, the, the Stroop color naming task, which was created initially in 1935. We modified this to try and measure whether people are thinking about suicide. And so in this task, you're seated at a computer screen, and it's an easier task. You're, you're asked to simply name the, the color of the word. Is it red or blue? And what we think is, if you're thinking about suicide, you'll be slower naming suicide-related words because they capture your attention, slow down your response, relative to your speed with naming neutral words like museum or table. Things that are emotionally salient are going to capture your attention. We also put in some negatively valence words like stupid, worthless, to see is this attentional bias, if it exists, specific to suicide or is it more of a general neg negativity effect? So what I want you to do, last participation, I apologize, Say red or blue. What's the color of the word? So first you'd see a fixation cross and then a word. Red. 
So you'd go through 48 of those trials, similar design. We went to the emergency room, um, tested patients as they were coming through to see, do people who are thinking about suicide have this bias? And we look here at interference scores. Interference meaning how much longer does it take you to name, first, the emotionally valence word relative to the neutral word. So reaction time for negative word minus reaction time for neutral word. People who, who came in making a suicide attempt are in black. People who didn't are in, are in white. We see a little bit of a, a slower response for negative words for suicidal, suicide attempters, but not for non-attempters, but no real difference between the two. What about interference for suicide-related words? There we see a huge difference with people who have recently made a suicide attempt taking much longer to name the color of suicide-related words than neutral words, and we see no such effect among non-suicidal, psychiatrically distressed people. And this test also improved the prediction of who made a suicide attempt over the next six months providing some suggestion that we, we are maybe st starting to have methods where we can uh, detect suicidal thinking and improve the prediction of who's going to um, act on their suicidal thoughts in the future. I wanna really stress the importance of, of, of this. We need to replicate these tests um, further and we have to improve their accuracy. I, I've said several times we improved um, the accuracy of the prediction of future suicide attempts, but we're starting from a place where we're not very accurate. So we still have a lot of false positives and we have a long way to go in getting better before we can even think about um, intervening with people out in um, the world. Uh, I wanna, again, encourage you to check out this site, which we're keeping up as a way to help us improve accuracy. We put different versions of these tests up and ask people about their history of suicidal behavior to see if we can um, develop the op optimal test. Um, and we need to learn how to incorporate these into clinical decision-making. If someone scores a positive 0.1 on one of these tests, and I tell a, a clinician, your patient scored a 0.1, they'll say, what the heck are you talking about? I don't know what that means. So we need to figure out how we factor this information into um, decision-making about um, a person's level of risk. We're testing out other cognitive processes that we think are involved, and perhaps most importantly moving forward, we're developing interventions that have to turn levers on some of these processes. So if somebody really identifies with death, can we create a computer-based targeted intervention that breaks that association? If people are, who are thinking about suicide really attend to suicide-related information, can we help disengage their attention to get them thinking less about suicide? And that's where we're headed now. And moving forward, the field is heading toward uh, using the approaches I've described, but a range of other approaches, uh, information in a person's medical record or other administrative records using genetic information, social media data, real-time biosensor data, information from your smartphone, all with consent. Can we collect this kind of information to have a, a finer grain signal of who's at risk for suicidal behavior with much more temporal granularity so we know who's at risk at what point in time? And this is where the field is heading, and I think there's reason to be optimistic that we are only going to get better at improving um, and predicting and preventing suicidal behavior. Thank you very much for your time. I'd like to just take a moment to thank the Museum of Science for inviting us here tonight. And I'd like to thank the audience for showing up. And one of the reasons that I would do that is because it shows you care, <clears throat> which is a theme, as I think you notice in, uh, in everything so far. Um, <clears throat> my wife reminded me that uh, uh, our granddaughter was here at the Museum of Science uh, recently. And her reaction, not surprisingly, was, uh, ooh, dinosaurs, which were very exciting. I think all of us are here because generally we want to know how things work. And I have the luxury of talking a little bit about what we know about how things work. Um, the, uh, my predecessors I should also thank. Marilyn, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Dose, that was a, a wonderful talk and you've done the bulk of the work because you've been on for, uh, you're going to be on for more than half the time. Um, Matthew, not only a brilliant talk, but I thank you for not wearing a tie uh, so that Dose didn't make me look too shabby here. Um, and the people actually said it have gotten us through the night. Uh, uh, Lisa and Tricia, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for helping us arrange this. <clears throat> um, so I have the pleasure of talking a little. They told me I could wander, by the way, but then I noticed they put the table here. I, I don't know if that's... Lisa's or Trisha's decision, but keeping me where I should be. Um, why do we get psychiatric disorders? Uh, and Dost referred a little bit to this. We're complex, you know, almost 100 billion brain cells, over 1,000 trillion connections. 
and a million processes inside those cells. Nothing I'm going to tell you tonight is going to get at that kind of uh, detail. It's all going to be oversimplified. And also, how can we improve our mental health? Um, ah, it did move. So, some of what I'm going to tell you isn't new at all. This is from 400 BC. We've known an awful long time that we get mood disorders, suicidal thoughts, uh, disturbances in thinking, what we call psychosis, uh, anxiety attacks, because of what goes on in the brain. We know the site of all of this is the brain. Um, and we know the brain is fragile. I mentioned some of its complexity, but what I haven't mentioned so far is not just all of the precise connections that we have to have in order to think, but all the coordinated activity. And it's electrical and it's chemical. And it all has to work right. It's quite sensitive to disruption. Any miswiring, any misfiring, any inadequate uh, or inaccurate signal processing, and we have something that is bothering us. Consequently, as Dose told you, psychiatric disorders are enormously common. The Surgeon General report of now over 20 years ago um, estimated that in a lifetime, <clears throat> nearly the majority of us will have an experience with a psychiatric disorder of some kind. So I was going to ask people to raise their hands, but I would say two things. One, at times like this, even though we were asked to be interactive, I hated raising my hand, so I would sit on my hand. But if you think to yourself, because we can't see you, as, uh, as Matthew said, um, which of these things, if any, does not cause psychiatric symptoms? Environmental toxins? Well, you know environmental poisons do. Um, prescription drugs? Sure. Thyroid gland? Very connected to our moods. What about some of the stuff at the bottom? Liver disease? Can liver disease cause psychiatric problems? Can uh, kidney disease? What do you think? What about cancers not in the brain? What about a cancer that's someplace en else in your body? Now, most of you in the audience say, well, the answer is obvious. Um, it's going to be all of the above. And the answer is it's not only all of the above, it's all of these and many more. All of these things can cause psychiatric disorders, brain trauma, uh, infections, cancers, inflammatory disorders, on and on and on and on. And of course, down to the bottom, which as we'll discuss uh, in just a few minutes, uh, what sets us up for a lot of the usual depressions and uh, usual anxiety disorders, genes, the things we inherit, the, the way we were born. So it's surprising all of us don't have a psychiatric disorder, I suppose. Uh, but, and, and one of the great themes of the evening, and here again, Marilyn made the point so beautifully, we also have resilience. There are ways in which we survive the troubles that we have, including these brain troubles. Stress. So in addition to all those physical things that we already know cause uh, psychiatric disorders, you've heard a lot about stress, and, and those spent some time talking about the things that happen to us, both physical and psychological. Loss is the biggest stress we deal with. Loss of persons, loss of job, loss of money, having to move, being insulted. All of these things can be enormously stressful and can put us at risk for depression, anxiety, suicidal behavior. Stress has powerful effects on the brain. And we do know a great deal about why it precipitates altered mood and thinking. At the top, uh, stress leads to release of key hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. They're very powerful. Cortisol goes straight to your brain. Not only goes straight to your brain, goes straight to the nucleus of your cells and turns genes on and off. It changes the way your cells are functioning. Um, stress activates the threat detection networks of the brain. The parts of the brain that tell you something bad is happening, you should be scared. You should be uncomfortable. You need to take action to protect yourself. Importantly, I know this is obvious, but we so often forget uh, how varied and different we are. Some people are more sensitive to stress and its consequences than others. Why? Many factors. I'll mention one. How you grew up how you were treated. This is an interesting study, and it, this is just one of many, which shows that in this particular case, um, the more abuse a child suffered growing up, the more reactive is the threat system of the brain. 
the more anxious that child is, the more reactive to bad circumstances. Now, we're not talking about not being especially nice to your children. We're not talking about saying, eat your vegetables. We're not talking about being cold versus warm here. There's no such thing as a schizophrenogenic mother. That's one of the worst calumnies that has ever been spoken. What we're talking about here is outright abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and extreme verbal abuse. Those things are very harmful to children. Those things are very harmful to everybody. So, experiences matter. Our brains are plastic. They're constantly changing. They're responding to everything in our environment. And uh, we become different people according to our experiences. But of course, a substantial degree of our risk is determined by inherited factors. No surprise, your height, your weight, your food preferences, what you like to wear, with whom you like to spend time, all of those have substantial inherited components, so of course psychiatric disorders do too. Here's some rates of uh, risks of various illnesses determined by genes. These are common illnesses which are thought to have considerable inherited uh, uh, determination of risk. And you'll see that they range around 50% up and down. Uh, diabetes, irritable bowel syndrome, risk of stroke, this is men and women. Uh, women have a higher inherited determination of risk for stroke than men do. Um, what about psychiatric disorders? And these are they. Um, schizophrenias, much of the risk is inherited, so with bipolar disorder. Uh, major depression, again, this is men and women. Uh, women have a higher determination of depression by genes than men do. Uh, panic disorders. Panic disorders, by the way, it is not known and was not mentioned tonight, but um, they may put people at the highest risk of suicide, more so than depression, uh, and often not talked about. They can be very, very dangerous disorders. What about suicide? Suicide is psychological and physical. What proportion of suicide risk is heritable? Um, again, you may sit on your hands, but you think it's higher, lower, or about the same as this. Uh, the answer? About the same, about 30 to 55 percent, depending on the study you believe, of suicidal risk is inherited, is determined by inherited factors. And Dose mentioned about uh, families. Suicide runs in families. It does not just run in families because people are aware of the suicide in family. In fact, often families are not aware of the suicide in the family. Usual reason, as Matthew referred to, it's covered up. People don't admit it. They want to hide it. So. Uh, they, it also runs in families because there's something about the tendency to lose that control, to hurt oneself, which is genetically determined. Which genes? This I cannot answer. No one can answer yet, except for a simple answer. It's not single genes. These are not Mendelian so-called disorders. You, they're not like blue eyes. They're not like the color of your hair. They're determined by the combination of effects of lots of genes. So for type 2 diabetes mentioned again, scores of genes are known. This is typical of medical disorders, not single genes. For schizophrenia, over 100 gene sites have already been documented, and it's suspected that over 8,000 genes contribute to the risk, the most current figures. For suicide, a score of genes have already been implicated, and there are certainly going to be more. Now, this last line here, I'm hoping will get everybody to think a little bit about who we are and what we share. Most of the implicated genes are present in healthy people. I have them, you have them, and I don't care which of the you in the audience I'm talking to, you've got them. You've got some of the genes of risk for schizophrenia, for uh, suicide. And in a family, the genes are not inherited from one side. Because so many genes are involved, they're always inherited from both sides. So don't blame mom or dad or either side of the family. These are all over the place. Are they our destiny? Absolutely not. Genes are just information for making proteins. They can be turned on and off. They interact with one another. They're acted on by outside influences. Uh, and they're a long way from thoughts, feelings, or behavior. There's no such thing as a gene for suicide. There's no such thing as a gene for an abnormal thought or mood. 
Um, in fact, all genes are at the bottom here. They make RNA, which makes proteins, which make the components of the cells. The cells make circuits and connections, and they're all influenced by everything that's going on around you, which you're incorporating and experiencing. Psychiatric disorders are mediated throughout all those levels of the brain. When we look at the brain and ask what's wrong, we see differences in genes, differences in proteins, differences in circuit activity, everything. That's good because that means we have all those places where we could possibly make things better, where we could understand what's wrong and have a good effect. We can have interactions anywhere here. We don't yet. Um, the current medications we use all act here and the psychotherapies pretty much all act on activity here. So there's a world of opportunity out there for other ways of affecting the brain and helping ourselves to feel better, be better, lead better lives. Um, I'd like to point out psychiatry, as Dost said, has many, many different ways to help people. Psychiatry is one of the most effective medical specialties there is. People get better. I've almost never seen anybody not get better as long as they uh, engage uh, seriously in, uh, in getting help and treatment. Um, and the medications in particular, as are the psychotherapies, are specific. Um, they're not nonspecific sedatives and stimulants and such. They are specific, uh, specifically targeted at individual disorders, and they're not necessarily good for another disorder. So what do we do? Uh, most often, of course, we combine uh, psychosocial therapies and medication in helping people. Medication is often helpful. Psychotherapy is almost always uh, useful. Um, skill and thoughtfulness are required because you have to individualize the treatment. We're all a little bit different. Uh, not all depression and suicidal thinking are alike, of course. Properly used, these uh, interventions, these collaborations between our patients and our clinicians work very well. Why does treatment fail? So here's a question for you. Why does treatment fail? What's the most common reason? Isn't given isn't followed, wrong treatment is given, bad reaction to treatment, non-response to an appropriate treatment. Make your guess, and here's the answer. No treatment is given. 70% of the reason why people don't respond to treatment is because there isn't any treatment. And here again, Dose gave you some of the answer that the resources aren't there. People aren't getting the help. Even if they seek the help, and even in the United States, even in Massachusetts, and we are number one, people are not getting the help they need. These others are in the order of their contribution to unsuccessful treatment. Treatment not followed is the second greatest reason. You can prescribe a medication, you can ask someone to come uh, for psychotherapy, they won't necessarily come or take the medication. Lastly, recovery and resilience. Um, many things contribute to risk. Many things contribute to recovery and resilience. We talked a little bit about genes. General health, and I know you've heard this and you've heard this and you've heard this, but it's worth beating in. If you keep your general health in order, you'll keep your psychiatric health in order. Lifestyle, diet, good diet, not necessarily supplements. If you don't have a vitamin deficiency, the evidence suggests that taking vitamins or other dietary supplements is not going to help you. A good diet is your strongest uh, tool. Exercise and activities, and especially social activities, are extremely healthy to uh, keep people from feeling sick, including psychiatrically ill, and giving them resilience. And of course, treatment, as we just discussed. <clears throat> um, just for your information, why do diet and exercise work? It, it, on, some people say, well, that seems ridiculous, you know. You're just telling me to do things that are generally healthy. But no, there are really specific physical mechanisms that make this work. Um, blood flow to the brain is better with good diet and exercise. Nutrients are delivered. Energy production and activity of the brain are improved. Um, one of the things Dost and I work on is energy production. The brain uses 20 times as much energy on average as the rest of the body to do its work because it's an electrochemical organ. So anything that affects energy affects the brain profoundly. Um, whoops. 
Uh, growth in inflammatory factor production is modulated so we don't attack our own body. Um, this is an interesting one, which is very recent. The bacteria you have in your intestines um, are in communication with the rest of your body, including your brain. And a bad diet and exercise changes too change the bacteria in your gut, and that can lead to depression and to poor thinking as well, to, to more confused thinking. Uh, and here's this interesting thing again about genes, um, that genes are regulated. Again, they turn on and off. You make protein, you stop making protein. A cell needs more of this, it needs less of that. All of that is regulated at the genetic level. And some of the regulation is due to factors, post-its that are put on the DNA and the proteins that surround the DNA that say, turn this on, turn that off. Those post-its, the methylation uh, markers, see now, <laughs> totally pushing the wrong buttons, change with diet and with exercise. You want healthier series of post-its on your DNA refrigerator, have a good diet, exercise. Too little is known about any of this. At this particular point, and again as Matthew was saying, we really need to know more about all of these factors, genes, diet, exercise, brain function. We've got to study resilience as well as studying illness. It's very important because they're not separate. Yin and yang, they, they go together. Can we do better? Can we help more? Here's my uh, advocacy portion. Um, this is the disease burden of common illnesses. You saw a bit of this from DOST. All psychiatric disorders, disease burden, is greater than anything else in the world. This is true in every country in the world. These are the annual budgets of some of the institutes of the uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health. Cancer, almost five billion. Uh, heart disease is three. Infectious disorders, almost four and a half. Where do you think psychiatric disorders are? One billion. Two, bil two billion, three, four, no, no one's saying four. Can't bid you up to four. You're right, 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion for the most disabling disorders on earth. All of these peaked in 2010. They're down since then. And here's an interesting fact about resources. When managed care was implemented, Around, 19, around late 1980s and 1990s, what got hit? Where did they save the money? Now, general medical expenditures grew a little year to year. Psychiatric expenditures decreased. They were the only part of medical uh, payments that decreased during the year of managed care. They have not rebounded. They're still down from where they were in 1990. So, I think this is the last slide, actually. It would help if society would provide better resources for treatment and research on psychiatric disorders. So here I'm taking advantage of you as an audience, but I hope you will tell your Congress people that uh, this is a worthy endeavor. We can come back sometime, maybe, and show you some more beautiful slides and things of what the research is like that is ongoing, that has great promise for teaching us better ways to identify individuals who have psychiatric disorders and help all of us who have those disorders. And with that, I thank you. <clears throat> and I'd like to ask our other speakers to come up, Marilyn, Dost, and Matthew. <laughs> um, so we're going to take maybe 15 minutes, and my friends here who can actually see the clock will uh, we'll keep us uh, in line on this. And um, I know you realize that Harvard professors are much better for talking at people than <laughs> talking with people, but we're going to try to talk with one another about uh, some of the, the stuff we've already discussed, and maybe about things that we could do differently. I, I think one of the, the biggest themes is what are we missing? Uh, Matt, before we all uh, came out tonight, we were talking about the uh, German Wings uh, tragedy. 
Uh, to me, one of the great aspects of the tragedy was that it became obvious over the days that there was evidence that there was a problem which, which was not addressed. And maybe in that regard and along the lines of the, uh, the question of uh, what could we do differently, because I, I understand there are privacy concerns and uh, uh, stigma concerns, and I mm -hmm. imagine people don't answer the questions right because they know it'll happen if, if they say they're right. suicidal. But what can we do differently to protect ourselves? And I don't just mean the people on the airplane, I mean the, the people who might kill themselves. Yeah, I think, to my mind, the biggest thing we can do is um, start asking. I think th probably the biggest barrier to getting help for people who are depressed and people who are suicidal is, is what Dose talked about, and just, just asking people. I think there's a, there's a fear. I think there's a fear among clinicians. There's a fear among um, your person on the street about asking someone if they're suicidal uh, because they might say yes. And then, you know, how do, how do we deal with that? So I think You might actually have to do something. Might have to do something. I think there's fear on, on all sides. So I think if, if we, and as Dose pointed out as well, there are studies suggesting that um, asking, show, randomized clinical trials showing that people who get asked about suicidal are no more suicidal or distressed than people who don't get asked about it. So we know that asking the question doesn't harm people in any way, yet there's still a great reluctance. So I think we can ask, we can do more screening, um, and we can use some of the methods that have been developed more recently to try and get at suicidal thinking. You guys were trained since I was trained, which is pretty obvious from my lack of hair in the grayness of it. <laughs> this doesn't help either. But are, are they still teaching? Are they teaching you should ask, or are they teaching that it can be hurtful? No, no. Um, the it, they're not. Absolutely. You have to ask yeah, have every to time. Ask. Yeah. That's right. The other thing that's interesting, uh, if linking this with the idea of resilience, is um, how do you instill resilience in somebody? You know, what can we do differently once you've identified people mm -hmm. who are at risk? There's lots of concerns. You know, the German pilot who thought maybe he would lose his job if he really came clean. Sure. Of course, as you said, now we know actually there was plenty of information. He had, in fact, come clean at certain times. But still, there is this concern about what might happen. And uh, Marilyn, you and I were talking a little bit about this. You have learned to manage your illness. That's correct, yeah. You, you know, there's something really special about people who can say, well, for me, the way it works is this, dot, dot, dot. And then they can tell you how that works. That gives you a sense of control. You can be in the driver's seat about what's going on compared to somebody who's terrified, overwhelmed, doesn't know where to turn. Is that a teachable skill? You know, what would you do for people to get them, put them in the driver's seat? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, you know, people are afraid of their mental illness sometimes, and, and they just want to fight it or hide behind it, like, get rid of it. I'm not going to think about it now until you have a flare and something comes up. Um, what I found, and it's really only in the past three or four years, um, where I really embraced the, the thought of recovery and moving forward and stuff, is that you have to fight. You have to be resilient. You have to say, okay, it's not working right now, but you know, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. Not easy. Definitely not easy. And I think that's where the peer support comes in a lot, too, the peer well, support woman. But Don't you fear that if you reveal to people that you've got a problem, that they might deny you something, which was the issue maybe with the pilot? Or have you gotten over that? I got over that. Did you feel that way when you were younger? I think for a while, I felt, well, well, I didn't like myself, first of all. I didn't like having a mental illness. I, I felt the stigma. I was self-stigmatizing, like there's something really wrong with you kind of things. Um, slowly as, I mean, very slowly, you know, it's been 25 years, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, I, I started to build more confidence in myself. I started to believe that, it was, wasn't my fault that I had a psychiatric right. illness. That's a big problem sometimes. Well, no, you put it beautifully, I thought, which is that if, if, if you have um, arthritis, you don't think that's right. me, you think that's something I, that happened to me or I've got. This is the same way. That's not you. I mean, that, that's. Right. Yeah, that's what I did. I put it in the category. Well, it's part of me, like the arthritis is, and, and this is what I do for it. And I, and I accept my illness for what it is. When and I learned about my illness. When you were going through this, especially earlier on, and you weren't as learned about it as you are now, mm -hmm. did people ask you, are you in trouble? Did they, did they ask, are you suicidal, or did they not? Um, I only dealt with my treaters with that stuff. I didn't have supports, um, which is, uh, again, is much better for around now with peers and things. Um, no, I would get asked, um, 
I have a therapist who, where I tell him I'm not feeling well and stuff. His first question is to me, do you need to be in the hospital? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're good at that. Uh, and I said, no, I'm not going. And eventually, you know, I either end up or not. But um, I, guess, I guess the questions I directed, they asked, yeah, are you suicidal or what are you thinking? Um, you know, what are your thoughts today? How are you feeling about yourself? Um, but you were, and you were never offended if someone asked that, I presume? No, I was never offended. You know, I was thinking about the, the, the young man who, where this tragedy occurred. And, and then one other thing we thought we should say to the audience, it's extremely unusual for mm -hmm. someone who is suicidal to hurt anybody else. It, it's very, very unusual. It's enough of a tragedy when someone hurts themselves. But um, with the pilot, and, and uh, I, I think that so often what we don't offer someone is the reassurance that if you say, I'm in trouble, that there'll be resources and there'll be another job or whatever. That doesn't happen sometimes. It didn't happen to me. Uh, right. When, you, I, when I was teaching, I'll give you an example. Um, as far as no support, when I was, it first became ill, where my therapist wanted me, I was suicidal. My therapist wanted me to come see her that very minute, leave work, come see me this very minute. Yeah. And I had a boss. I had a Catholic school. I had a nun. I said, I have to go, and trusting my nuns and religion and stuff, I told her what was going on. Two weeks later, I get a, a, a meet with her, and she has a legal document Gosh. that I'm supposed to sign, saying I'm not going to commit suicide <clears throat> while I'm with the children or teaching at that school. Wow. There was no empathy, no thought of asking how I'm doing and what am I doing about it. It's like you just can't have it, and you can't kill yourself. Well, well that, that, that's true. I, I, uh, one other thing which I experienced in my life, which I struggle with a great deal, is that one of my responsibilities for years was running a hospital. And um, Dose will tell you the same thing. Matthew will tell you the same thing. We're taught you, can't ask, you cannot ask people at work, are you in trouble? You can't ask that. You can't ask, are you depressed? You can't ask, um, are you suicidal? It, that is actually not uh, something you're legally allowed to do. Right. I don't know. What do you feel about it? I don't care so much. <laughs> yeah. You would do it anyway. Right? I do do it anyway. Yeah, I me do. Too. Yeah, <laughs> because I and maybe this is like going to land me in jail at some point, but or or lose my license. But I, for me, I always try to err on the side of safety and think about mm -hmm. the sort of legal eth eth ethics. Yeah. Yes, legal issues less so. Uh, but I don't think uh, that's everyone. I think there's a big fear, uh, not just about asking, but about what's going to happen. What if I do something incorrectly? Um, that keeps people from doing research on, on suicide, treating people who are, who are suicidal. Um, sometimes it's tough for people who are suicidal to get a regular therapist because they're sort of handed off from, you know, this from, from person to person uh, because people aren't uh, comfortable on, on either end. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I usually tell people uh, I treat, if, if you're not feeling well at 3 a.m., I want to hear from you then. I don't want to hear from you at at 8 in the morning, and I certainly don't want to hear that something bad has happened and, right. and that we can't even fix it. So you're absolutely right. But I think we're intimidated, you know, and I think, uh, uh, I suspect we even feel that if we ask, we're stigmatizing somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. right. you know? and, and I think there's uh, reluctance among, even among clinicians. And of course, that's communicated, whether implicitly or explicitly, um, to the people who are suffering. So if the clinician actually breaks that barrier and talks about it in a matter-of-fact, empathic, open-minded manner, um, it actually helps the person also gain control over their experience as opposed to feeling overwhelmed by it. That's what we teach trainees. That, you know, it's how you ask the question. If you went to see your primary care physician and they said, you know, could you please take off your pants and sort of giggle, <laughs> I'd walk out. I'd be freaked out. They said, take off your pants. I take off my pants. Nowhere else does that happen. They say, you tell me to do something, I do it because it's a calm, dispassionate demeanor. And so we teach our trainees to ask, ask the question in the same way. Are you thinking about suicide? Are you feeling like you're going to hurt yourself? Don't sort of be shy about it and timid about it or chuckle or you know, nervous laughter. Just ask the question. Yeah, that was an interesting thing about going into medicine. One of the first things that happens to you when you go to medical school um, and for me, where I went, they gave you uh, patient experiences in the first year. And you'd feel, I can walk into a room and people undress or, or tell me very private stories. Or uh, That's a remarkable experience. Yeah. But uh, um, you can't handle it all in a physician's office. I, the, uh, I, suspect very, I suspect this gets asked very infrequently in a PCP's office. 
Mm -hmm. But it should be asked all the time. Every annual physical should also probably include a how are you feeling, mm -hmm. are you in trouble psychiatrically series of questions, or a Stroop test or, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever feels right. It's been said people will be more honest with the computer, so, you know, you, you want to do something computerized. Mm -hmm. But it should be at work, I think, and in the schools too, shouldn't it? It should definitely be in the schools, you know. Um, the kids today, um, you know, it's getting younger and younger to, to get, when they're depressed with their... Um, or showing different signs of a, an illness. Um, ADHD is prevalent in the schools, you know, and that affects their emotions so much. It definitely should be a, um, they, sh and they should have presentations. And, and they, I think at the high school level, they do more with it, and they have, they have screenings and things at the high school and level. And do they teach the warning signs of... Uh, they do, I think at the high school level, they do yeah. the warning signs, but they really need to do it younger. Um, I had a six or seven year old come up and tell me they wanted to die. You know, they yes. wanted to cross the tracks and die. You yeah. know. Um, that, that's a very interesting fact, by the way, Marilyn, that it, it when, when I was taught, um, and I, I won't blame the, the particular model, <laughs> but I was taught children did not have depression. Right. I actually right. taught that. It was obviously not true, especially when you went to the child units and you, you talked to kids. But increasingly, the evidence shows that because these are um, conditions that are lifelong and often early onset, that of course children have uh, these problems. Of course, some children are more depressed, more sensitive, more anxious, having funny thoughts of one kind or another. You know, of course they are. And if we ignore it, who are we helping? No, because that's what happened um, at, the, at the time. The protocol was: I was the teacher. You go to the guidance counselor, yes, guidance counselor, yes. you know the hierarchy and stuff. They never followed through. As far as I know, he's still alive, but uh, yeah, must have had a rough time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they didn't do anything. You know, it's like, you can't do this. You can't be depressed. You can't. Must be some. Must be something wrong at home. You and that if something. that's wrong, you can't. I mean, then maybe you will never be okay. Right. I mean, that's the children are worried about. Will I grow up normally right. and have friends? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were. In. I was just noticing the time. I want oh. to make sure we give the audience. You're being responsible. Yeah, yeah we, we, we want to give <laughs> time uh, to ask questions. But may I uh, just maybe ask you one? Other thing? Is it any different in the rest of the world? I mean, uh, you grew up in a different place and you travel a lot. Sure. Um, oh no. Um, so I grew up in Istanbul, Turkey, and I still have family there. I go back and forth all the time, and I know that region, the Middle East, and kind of Eastern Europe pretty well. Um, the stigma is even greater. Um, you know, there are many circumstances where it's not okay to even talk about somebody who's completed suicide. Suicide is often covered mm. up. You know, the statistics aren't reliable because yes. it's so shameful to have somebody who died by suicide that it's reported as you know carbon monoxide poisoning or something else, for right. example. So accident, um, yeah, right. accidents, yeah, absolutely. So I think you know the Western cultures have made more progress along these lines. Yeah. There is plenty of work to be done. Okay, thank you. So we open it up? Yeah. Mm. We're not allowed to choose. <laughs> we're, we are blameless. Here. So a very just practical question. If, uh, if you suspect that someone might be feeling these feelings, and you ask, and they admit it, then what do you do? You yeah, want to answer that? You want me to answer that? Good. You, you've been talking less now. So. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to get him help. Um, you know, it depends very much on the circumstances. If that person has a treater who knows that person well, so they don't. you know, mm -hmm. and so if they do, then that's a, the right mechanism. If they don't, and you're really concerned about them, call 911. You got to mm -hmm. get them to a safe place. You got to get them around people in a therapeutic environment, getting them into the emergency room. Um, getting them I into the hospital if necessary. These are all things that can be done depending on the details. One thing I will say though, um, I've certainly heard from people with psychiatric problems, the concern that if they utter the word suicide, they're gonna get locked up in a hospital. That's sort of the mm. mental image. And it's really not true. There is very much a graded response. It depends on the level of risk. So if you're worried about somebody today, and yes, you know, if you're really worried that somebody might be dead by the end of the day today, the only thing it can do is get them into a safe place and uh, get them into the hospital. But there's such a huge range between nothing and that point that that mental image is really not quite right. And I wish, you know, we could get the word out that there are many options. It might include going to the emergency room, but then being referred to another treatment that's not being in a locked unit in a hospital. But, but I want to reinforce that, which is the take action. 
take action. If you saw somebody uh, who fell in the street and had a seizure, you wouldn't just walk by. And in all the instances you see in the newspapers where people were injured, suicides, homicides, um, there were premonitory signs. It was well known that people are in danger, but the actions were not taken. So what Doe said is exactly right. If you even have to think that this is an emergency, it's an emergency and get help. If it's not an emergency, if there's a family doctor, call the family doctor. If, if someone needs to be taken to the emergency room, go to the emergency room. But that's what 911 is there for. Yeah. Can I make a comment too? Uh, Please. That um, listen to them, listen to the person, uh, believe yes. them, you know, to believe the person. Because lots of times when you, people, when they talk, oh, I'm just gonna kill myself. You know, you comes off like a matter of fact kind of thing and stuff. People aren't believed, and they say, oh, you should never do that and stuff. And, you know, three days later or something, they, they're gone. Yeah, it's right to ask, are you okay? Why did you say that? You know, yeah, is, oh, is yeah, everything, definitely. you know, you, it, it's, it's right to ask these questions. Yeah. And uh, I want to drive home the point. I think it's a really popular misconception that if you go to the hospital, if you call 911 or go to an emergency room for a psychiatric reason, you're in against your will. There, it is mm. very much a greater response. Absolutely. And if you're unsure, bring someone to an emergency room. They'll, they'll have a psychiatric evaluation done. They'll make a determination. Maybe you can just have a safety plan for what to do if things get worse, and here's a referral to a treater that you can see tomorrow or the next day. Um, let's hold you for a few hours just to sort of see how things are. Uh, but it is, you know, there's no reason to be afraid. It, just like if someone <clears throat> feels tight in the chest, you bring them to the ER. The same should be true for suicidal thoughts. Bring them in, get them evaluated, or go in, get evaluated, and get help if it's, if it's indicated. Well, the, yes, right, because it's not just if you see it. If, if you feel you that way, it. you're yes. absolutely yeah. right. Just as if you have tightness in the chest, if you feel that way, you go get help. Yeah. That's right. Uh, question here. Uh, as I recall uh, Dr. Knox's story about Gia Alamond, and as I listened to uh, Dr. Cohn's words that suicidal people generally will never hurt anyone else, it immediately brought into my mind Robin Williams. Uh, here was a guy who when he encountered an audience, everyone in that audience felt good, all right, after their interaction with Robin Williams. Uh, and when he was alone, he hanged himself. Is this uh, paradoxical dichotomy, uh, let's call it, uh, is this a common profile for suicidal people? Well, you know, Marilyn referred to this when Dost asked her about it, which is, um, can you be high and low at the same time? Yes. Can you be charming and distressed at the same time? And Matthew, you were, you mm -hmm. were talking about that. Absolutely. Yes. We're, we're that complex. Now, comedians will tell you uh, themselves that an awful lot of them feel that they have mood swings. That that's why they can get into that state. So, and there's a lot of literature on creativity and humor and such that suggests that there are correlations among these factors. But I think it's fair to say there's no prototype. There's no stereotype. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody can get suicidal. Anybody can mm -hmm. get depressed. And you see all kinds of combinations. That's certainly your experience Nine as a peer counselor and yours as clinicians, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say uh, there's kind of a romantic notion, the tears of a clown, that there is yeah. this, you know, internal suffering. But to the rest of the world, they're sort of charismatic and, you know, uh, interesting and fun and so on. But it can happen to anyone. There is morbid people and there is charismatic people mm -hmm. and they can both commit suicide. I will also say, you know, Robin Williams, of course, not knowing anything about him other than what's in the papers, but it sounds like he had struggled with psychiatric issues throughout yes. his life, with depression, maybe with bipolar disorder. And also he had mm -hmm. recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So he was an aging white man with a psychiatric illness and now a new medical condition. You know, that's sort of, the, again, um, it, this is exactly what the uh, uh, epidemiology says. And you know, uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that can be assessed in, on yeah. a yearly basis in an exam, and yet yeah. we don't. Yeah. Next question here. Thank you. Hi. You talked a lot about a recent research in detecting and preventing suicide from a clinician's point of view. I want to ask that question from a parent's point of view. Mm. Uh, for teenagers, for uh, young adults, what do we parents, what can we do when uh, oftentimes our kids don't, wouldn't even talk to us? <laughs> so what advice would you give us parents? You have to watch behavior when you, when you don't have other forms of communication. What would you say? 
I would say do your best to, to, to as a father of three, do your best, and I can relate to my kids not wanting to talk to me, um, <laughs> do, do your, or anyone else, uh, do your best to, to talk to them. And if they're not responsive, I think it's okay to ask the questions about how they're feeling and, and ask about depression and anxiety and about self-harm if you have any suspicion. Um, we discussed the fact that asking someone about suicide isn't going to make them suicidal. Same as that, asking about depression isn't going to make someone depressed or anxious and so on. So I think a, a point I would make is it's okay to ask these questions and at least it, you're letting them know you're opening up the, the, the channel of communication. They know they can come to you and talk to you about this kind of thing. And in and fact, teachers, it's, yeah. it, it's important for them to know that you care. Absolutely. So if you, you know, if you don't try to talk to them, they'll take that as negative, as you know. But when you do try to talk to them, they may try to shut you down, but they're actually appreciating the fact that you're asking. I, I, but I would say again, watch behaviors. When you mm -hmm. see changes in behavior, mm -hmm. when you see, uh, especially things like not going out with friends, isolating oneself in one's room, if you think that a child is using drugs, you have to be very worried. When I was um, in high school, uh, my behaviors changed. In ninth grade, I was a straight-A student. Um, you know, really proud about going to school. Wouldn't think of cutting class or anything like that. By 10th and 11th, suspended in 10th grade for the first time, acting out. She got cut classes. Um, spoke back to teachers. Spoke back to teachers a lot. Gave my hard time, things like that. My behavior changed as things at my home were deteriorated. You know, um, and at that time, of course. And, and you were feeling different. And I was feeling different. And I yeah. was started with depression at that time. Yeah. Uh, but nobody noticed then. They, guidance houses were different then. <laughs> Yeah, but you pointed yeah. out, too, that's another behavioral sign. Grades. Yeah. You know, are, are kids going to school? Are, are they doing their work? Are they getting the grades? Yeah. I've got another question here. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge uh, with us. Um, I, my question is, um, when is depression a symptom of a, a mental illness, and when is it the actual mental illness? What's the difference between the two? Can I do my variants of normal talk, sure. or is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's no, there's no line. That, 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 and that's, I think that's one of the ways in which we put our, all of ourselves at a disadvantage. Everybody gets depressed, which is why you're asking that. Um, what we use is what Dost put up on the screen, which is if the symptom is getting in the way of your having good relationships, doing a job, um, having a decent life, then that's a disorder. And it, it, illness, forget illness, you know, maybe that's too loaded a word, and forget disorder except for its real meaning, which is something's not ordered right. You, you, want, you want stuff to be different. And as we've said before, it doesn't take suicide to give some of the advice. You don't feel right, get some help. Talk to somebody and, and see what's going on and whether uh, you could help yourself used to be said we could all benefit from some, from some psychotherapy. Um, that may be true, but we, could, we certainly all benefit from talking out uh, how we're feeling and what our options are. So what I've said to people is um, psychiatric disorders, by and large, are not illnesses. They're variants of normal. But um, you don't want to be too depressed. You don't want to be too high because you'll do stupid mm -hmm. things. You'll never think completely straight, but you don't want your thinking to be so confused that you can't get through the day and, and go about your tasks. So not a boundary, but if you're worried about it, talk to somebody about it. There was a, a, just a, a, a quick vignette about this. There was a lot of discussion about the bereavement exclusion and the mm -hmm. definition of yeah. major repression in the definitions of mental illnesses, you know, the, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, DSM, which uh, is the list of disorders in psychiatry. And in previous editions, it said, if you show all the signs and symptoms of depression, you can be diagnosed with depression, except if somebody close to you died within the last six months. Yeah. Then it's just bereavement, <laughs> it's not really depression. Oh, wow. And you know, lots of critics said, that doesn't make any sense. It's exactly the same, the person looks exactly the same. In one case, you know why it happened, and now we're telling them, no, you don't have a problem. You know, we're gonna withhold diagnosis and treatment and whatever else, because we know what happened to you, compared to somebody else, mm -hmm. maybe they got depressed because they lost a job, or they got depressed for no reason at all. Um, and you know, it becomes a very artificial debate. And as Bruce is saying, this is, this is a continuum. And uh, that bereavement exclusion has actually been removed in the latest edition. Next question here. 
Uh, hi, I have a kind of almost flipping it on the other side that sometimes it seems like life circumstances, not just genes or other things, but circumstances, whether we think of the Holocaust or experiencing slavery or sexual abuse, could be totally understandable as a reason for a psychological disorder that leads to depression and thoughts of suicide. So the question around that is, can we learn something from people who have been through that who are resilient enough to resist going into the deepness of suicide attempts and come out with a life-affirming kind of approach? I don't know if there's any research into what it is that if I had that experience and went very dark and someone else had the exact same experience and didn't, can we learn from that and is that something, or that we can look forward to in the future understanding to help us on how to treat this? Yes. Such a, oh, Situational, like uh, depression and mental. Well, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, that, that's why we were saying um, who we are is both our, it's not just our genes. I mean, genes don't, genes are part of who we are. Our experiences are part of who we are. And the whole interact, interactivity we go through all our life between experiences and other aspects of biology are who we are, including memories. And um, the answer to your question is yes, the people are studying exactly that. In, in fact, our lab is studying that. Uh, maybe some of the other labs yeah. around you are certainly studying that. Mm -hmm. So what you want to understand, in part, uh, if you look at it as a, from a clinician's point of view, and I admit this is biased, but it's what I do, you want to understand why some people are resilient, because what ultimately you want to be able to do is help other people be more resilient. So we're definitely studying that, and we study it genetically, because some people are more resilient for genetic reasons, and we study it um, psychologically, psychologically yeah. because some people are more resilient for psychological reasons. That's absolutely right. And uh, you know, this is um, there's a lot of research going into this um, field, and uh, some of the things that have come out of particularly economically disadvantaged inner city children, mm -hmm. why some of them become unusually successful, yeah. well above average individuals in society, but some don't. Um, one of the things is the the presence of a narrative of uh, an ocean that the person is in charge, they have a life story that certain things happen to them and this is what they did in response to that and so on, as opposed to uh, you know, an inability to form a story about what's going on, an inability to make sense of their experiences. So you know, these are things that can be taught. You can take people and try and get them to a place where they have a narrative about what happened to them and uh, how they're reacting to it and that could actually be a good thing for the person. This is, you know, the other issue that maybe we didn't say clearly enough is this, this old thing about nature, nurture, genes, environment, as if they're, there's a dichotomy and they're on opposite sides, totally false. There's no dichotomy, they're just contributors. And people can be taught, on a, helped on a psychological basis to feel better. They can be helped with sometimes with biological medications uh, or other approaches to feel better. Very often the same treatments from opposite ends have similar effects. So you have to treat people as whole people. You know, you, you have mm -hmm. to be aware of their complexity. And there's something to be learned from each person, whether they've been traumatized or not, of course. There's something to be learned from each person. I think that's what's gotten me through, is by resilience. Just to where we am today, Agreed. definitely. Um, you know, 20 years ago, I could barely function. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, everything happened to me. You, you name it, it happened. That's how my life was, you know. Sure, but... If something's stuff, stuff going to happen, it's going to happen to me, kind of thing. And it's hard to fight that back. But that's what happens. You get through the worst of it. You get through the treatment to get you into a, bit, a little better spot. Then you say, okay, now I, I want to stay here, so I need to fight. I need to make plans myself how what to do the next time this happens what can I learn from this experience you know um, you know it doesn't do me any good for example when I was hurting myself to call my therapist after I had hurt myself that would just put me in the hospital you know eventually it's like well I call him or he makes me throw out razor blades and this it's terrible you know kinds of things finally I learned that you know where self harm isn't an, is is an option. It's a cho it's a choice. You make the choice. Where it before I believed it wasn't, and it's like okay, well what's I'm feeling terrible, but now I can call my therapist first, and it gets me to a safe place beforehand. You know before I hurt, take that step to hurt myself, which always makes you feel worse. 
But you yeah. went beyond that, actually. You're a very good example of what we were talking about, which, because you first found the resilience in yourself, but then you went on to, to be teaching it to other people. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what you learned about yourself, now you share with others, Absolutely. and that helps with their resilience. So, you know, it's a good example of uh, what? Uh, passing it on. Right. You know, it's, it's learning and passing it on. What's important about peers working with, with peers. Yes. Because when, you sh when you've experienced it, you know, you can really talk to somebody and say, say well, this is how I bought it. Maybe this will help you. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But people move on that way. They grow. They learn more about themselves and what they can tolerate and what they can't. There are things I can't tolerate. If I get manic, it's like, stay away from me when the noise comes, you know, because <laughs> I get very irritable with my mate. It's not that happy-go-lucky thing. But... You, the more you learn about yourself and you, and you try different things, you know, and I'm not saying it's easy, and people you know, hear from, have been treated, um, it's a very hard battle, and you have to push yourself, um, and hopefully you get the support. That's what you, people, you have to push for support from people, too. Um, but I had to do it alone, mostly, and maybe that's what put the resilience in me, that... Uh, you know, I, I can do this, and I'm not I'm going to prove to everybody. But, you know, because I didn't have anybody really to support. So I had them periodically. But I also have a great team that I've worked with for 20 years. Um, that got me through a lot of it. Sure, but, but that's what so many people don't get, right? Right, yeah. You know, and and uh, clinicians, too, by the way. Um, one of the programs we initiated years ago was that it's not just that peers should talk to people in trouble people who've gone through these experiences should talk to clinicians about how they got through it. Mm. We need, this is the you need to learn from everybody mm. else argument, otherwise you're not going to get it. You, you, you can't just take the received knowledge from uh, your psychology training or your medical school and think that's what life is about. It's not. That's true. Well, I've got another back. question here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you had mentioned earlier in the meeting tonight, that the rate of suicidality is the highest after somebody leaves the hospital in the first week. Mm. If I were a mental health professional, that would really concern me. I would be saying, what are we doing wrong in the hospital? One thing that comes to mind is the fact that, um, like with me, I didn't get any sleep when I was depressed and they were shining these bright lights in my eye every 15 or 20 minutes. And that made me more depressed because I still wasn't getting any sleep. So this is just one example. But one of the things that maybe somebody should do is say, what can the hospital do better that it isn't doing now? You, you ain't kidding. Uh, and um, the one of the hardest things about running a hospital is knowing that things aren't being done right and yet being so constrained about trying to change so much. The institutions grew up with a history that was not always sensitive to people's real needs and to the way people need help. And to some extent, they're stuck with them and we're still having trouble getting over. So, you know, take an example. No one's suggesting that the old model of everybody should be in the hospital for two months is a good model, but the model of everybody should be in the hospital for three days isn't a very good model either. Isn't everybody different and, and, and shouldn't, shouldn't that be attended to? In the hospital, you know, the, the constraints are you want to protect everybody, you want to know they're safe, so you're, you're shining the flashlight around the room to know that they're safe, and yet you're disturbing people. There has to be a better system, and in this day and age, um, one of the systems that has been discussed is can we not have a non uh, a monitoring that isn't disturbing people, whether it's video or just um, you can have activity monitors on people and you can know if they're sleeping or if they're agitated. So are there things we could implement that would be very helpful? Yes. Although I will go back to the other concern I have, which is, you know, it's the old who's going to pay for it. We, we're in these mm. terrible struggles in our society um, where we you know the term destructive uh, change, where you need to destroy something to remake it to, uh, to get to a better place? We're not doing that very well in the medical field, and certainly not in the psychiatric field. So your criticisms are valid, and I, 
uh, some things are better than they were 10, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years ago. A lot of things need change. I think also, though, and in this day and age with the recovery movement and stuff, is that people who have a mental illness um, need to take responsibility themselves for That's true. for um, how they feel and what they what they're doing about it. Ask the questions for the doctor. I go in the hospital, and I know better than they do when I should be discharged. And I tell them, okay, now I'm ready. And it usually works. I work co cooperatively with them. No, I'm not ready yet. I need another day. And I had an example where I was discharged. I told them I wasn't ready. For sure, I'm not ready. Went to one of the programs on the campus and was back in the hospital within two weeks in worse shape. And I said, I told you so. <laughs> That's true, yeah. but, but sometimes the insurance company will say, I know. you know, too bad. You know, you're out. And, and there's so That's many places where the system is broken. I, I completely agree with you that... I guess I'd broaden in and say the communication between the person being treated and the people doing the treatment is not really as good as it should yeah. be. And then there's the broken communication with who's ever paying for the treatment, short term and long term. And one of the hard arguments to get across, and, and again, uh, I had the explicit experience of talking to somebody in a position where who could make change of saying, for the same amount of money you're spending now, we can give you better treatment by having more flexibility in when people come in and when people leave and whether they get to go to an intermediate experience rather than go home. And they said, nah, um, we got a system that works and we can afford it. We're not going to take any mm -hmm. chances with any of that stuff. I don't envy you guys fighting insurance companies. <laughs> no, nah, you're, you're in it too. <laughs> yeah, I heard you have, you know, they, because I know people battle for me with insurance companies. Yeah, sure. You know, the, they're not they're evil. Stay. You know, it, it's just mm. that they're businesses. It, it, it's, yeah, it's, well, they're constrained. They could be human too. This will be the last question. Okay. <laughs> um, kind of going in a different direction. Um, as somebody who has been struggling through 28 years of depression and anxiety and PTSD and um, lots of, you know, struggles, um, now now starting to go through more of a postpartum depression is kind of um, uh, an extreme low that I haven't been to before. What um, what kind of and I, as some, you know, I, I'm in the middle of, you know, being treated and on medication, just kind of waiting and waiting that that period of time where um, mm -hmm. the medication isn't quite there yet. And is it going to work, or is it, you know, um, you know, how long it's going to take? And you know, well, how, what kind of advice would you, you know, might give somebody who's just to get through? kind of the day-to-day -day struggles of, of just holding on to the, I, you know, because as I say, is, you know, I wake up and I'm breathing and that that's mm -hmm. my, that's okay. Sounds like one for Marilyn. Are you isolated at home? Are you, are you isolated at home? I actually do have um, a support system of, um, um, my boyfriend, the, my baby's father, and my mother, who, if I did not have them, I probably would not be here right now. Yeah. And that I would suggest you reach out to other people um, to, to, to give, get the support, more, the more support you can get. Um, there are what's called recovery learning centers around the state where peers um, of all kinds of experiences um, get together and they have they have groups that help and but they're so positive um, and they and they're very good for support if I didn't have peers to go to I'd hang out with you get out of the house and I know depression is so hard to get out um, then I would I would have been gone a long time ago you know um, you have to reach out to other people while you while you're struggling waiting for the meds to work and and all that um, you know, must have just had a baby, I take it. So, you know, bring that, bring the baby with you, you kinds of things. Don't let it hold you back. Get out. Get out of the house. That's what makes it worse. That's my worst enemy if I stay in the house. 
Um, so by waiting and treating, get a larger peer, uh, support if you can. But there, uh, where are you from? North Andover. Uh, so yeah, there's the Northeast Re uh, Recovery Learning Center up in um, Andover, isn't it? I think it's in Andover. Yeah. Um, who are doing great things. They have all kinds of activities. They have all age people. Um, and they, they're really looking to help. And they, they have just entertainment. It's not therapy. You know, it's getting with people, sharing experiences. Yeah. Well, humor. It, uh, you, you, oh, humor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you have to find things that, that, that do give you some pleasure. That's important. Right, that's important. And for most of us, it is human interaction in part, and you're right. I mean, in, individual interaction, group interaction. Um, you should be reassured that you've gone through a hormon hormonal storm, you know, and that's going to change now. You, you, your, your body is changing. It's going to settle in all likelihood. It's true that the treatments, whether medications or or psychotherapies um, or interactions take time to get you back to where you were. But um, usually, 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 almost always, people settle if they can hang on. In this interim, and this is the other thing we've been saying, all of us have been saying, protect yourself. If you feel in danger, take action to protect yourself and, and let give yourself time to uh, uh, for all of the good things you're doing and just time itself, which with the changes that will occur to help you. Last thing, and, and this is for everybody um, who, who may be dealing with any doctor or any clinician anywhere, you have to ask yourself, am I getting the help that I need from, from my, uh, my treaters? For anybody, and this is whether it's general medicine or psychiatry or psychology, you gotta be comfortable with the people helping you. If you have questions about that, you have to look elsewhere. So I agree with that. I think being in good treatment is really important yeah. right now. Um, this is not a time to sit back and see how things will evolve. No. You know, you want to be aggressive with the right treatment. So surrounding yourself with the right people, getting out there, being active. You know, medications are fine. There are plenty of other, you know, treatments in psychiatry um, that can be considered if the meds aren't working. Yeah. And then good psychotherapy. So having all of those things in place, there's not going to be a one single thing that will just go in there and fix the problem. It, you know, you have to work on all these fronts. Can, can we quote you, though, to, as the last comment, which is hang in, get yeah. help, this will pass. Yeah. It does pass, yeah, it does pass. Good luck. What an amazing, amazing evening. Thank you all Thank you. so very much. It's incredible. <laughs>